Earlier this month, I visited glorious Deutschland, not to be confused with Dutchland, to attend the 9th annual Gamescom, which is actually the second biggest gaming trade show in the world. But instead of previewing a bunch of games coming out in a few weeks that everyone else is going to be previewing anyway, I decided to look into a bit of hardware whose purpose fascinates me in a morbid way. I got a press release for The Shadow, a PC cloud gaming streaming box whose marketing materials promise the world. A more grounded explanation would pitch the product as basically a little streaming box that you plug a screen and some input devices into to stream video of PC games from a remote server, which is a service that I'm typically real skeptical of and have had negative experiences with through OnLive before. But Shadow's gimmick is quite different in that you're not picking from a lineup list of games here, but rather streaming an entire gaming PC to your screen. Shadow CEO Emmanuel Freund set up a demo, running Rise of the Tomb Raider from their home servers through Gamescom's crowded LAN with no perceptible input lag or even video compression that I could tell. Admittedly, from their own booth and without really being ready to do any kind of serious test. I wiggled the mouse around and things felt fast and responsive enough. I looked real close at dark shadowy blotches on the screen that should be stained with compression artifacts, but things still looked sharp enough. Uh, I'm Emmanuel Freund, I'm one of the three founders of Shadow, of Blade. Uh, Blade is a company that is uh, launching the product Shadow. Shadow, uh, it's a cloud computer, it's, a compu it's your next computer, it's a computer of the future. Basically, in a normal computer, normally you have the components that are inside the computer. What we did is to take the components outside the computer and to place, place them in a ultra-secure data center. So, the, the result of that, is that you can access your computer from anywhere. You can access it from uh, the shadow box. Uh, so shadow box is a, is a very nice uh, uh, thin client computers with every, uh, every uh, connection that you may have on the computer. Mm -hmm. And of course you have a Windows 10 home, you can install every software you can do. I mean, it's a computer, it's something else than a computer. But you can also access it from any device, from your smartphone, from your tablet, from a, from a 4K TV, from a, from a Mac, for example, from anywhere. So that's the first benefit. The second benefit, actually, is a, it's a computer as a service, a subscription uh, computer. You need to pay 29 euros by month to get uh, a computer around 1,500 euros worth. Shadow's gamble is using a piece of hardware to pick up the slack of software solutions that have failed in the past. The box decodes video at a lower hardware level than conventional PCs without going through extra layers of operating system software, similar to the optimization advantages consoles have, and thus much of the product's philosophy is designed around the idea of this box replacing gaming PCs, a reality that hit me once he alt-tabbed out of Tomb Raider into this Windows 10 desktop shell. He showed that Windows desktop and that game running on everything that shouldn't support it from a Mac laptop to a living room TV to a cell phone with a controller slapped on. Uh, how easy would it be for players to mod their games or develop games? As easy as a local computer, what is really important is that it's a normal computer. For every usage point of view, it's a normal computer where you have a total freedom on it. You can develop you can develop uh, games on it. You can you can even put virtual machine on it. You can uh, you can do uh, you can write your own documents. You uh, you can you can even you can do whatever you like. I mean, it's a computer. But the shadow's advantages as a PC workstation are also implications. On that note, though, what happens if one of the users uses it as a as a proxy for illegal downloads? So uh, it it will work. We. Basically, we, we, uh, we, we hope to use the, the goodwill of users. Uh, I mean, they know, and our users know that our, benefit, our business model is made by people that are using their computer as a normal computer. So if your goal is to use a computer, this computer as a professional way to build a server that will be available 24-7, then it's not going right with us. And what we will do is probably like a Netflix, like if for two hours there's no reaction, no movie played, nothing, of course, then at this point uh, we'll uh, write a pop-up saying, are you, uh, are you still there? And if the guy doesn't say yes or no, then we'll disconnect him, after something like that. The concept of replacing personal computers with cloud-based computers is a lofty ideal, but it's not exactly a brave new world. In fact, it's kind of a post-apocalyptic one where the worst has already happened. OnLive launched in 2010 to futurist hype celebrating the irony of it all. 
predicting that in the upcoming years we'd be returning to a situation where computers would become terminals to mainframes once again. Except this time, a cloud-based mainframe would have unlimited power, making hardware upgrade cycles obsolete, and booting up a game would be a one-click process happening right inside a browser window. But it's been seven years since then, and while cloud computing technologies have enjoyed a quiet revolution in optimizing server-side processes like the AI in Titanfall, the predicted breakthrough success of streaming over entire games obviously hasn't happened. One skeptic early on was Gabe Newell himself, who said in 2013 that cloud gaming works until it starts to be successful, at which point it falls over. Cloud gaming works until it starts to be successful, at which point it falls over from its own success. And so as soon as everybody starts using a continuous network connection in order to get their applications, consumer IP pricing is going to go through the roof. In other words, once millions of people end up streaming 1080p 60fps videos of the same demanding high-end games all at once, bandwidth is going to be precious enough to make the experience laggy enough to be too unappealing for millions of people to use in the first place. Gabe couldn't picture a situation where mass market economics of scale would work here. Since then, OnLive has ceased to exist, and the few remaining cloud gaming streaming companies that do exist have had to work with the reality that it's a pretty niche market for pretty specific situations. Cloud computing usually, there's a lot of people doing cloud computing and cloud gaming, but basically it's always with the same kind of technology, which is actually technology that's quite old, by sharing resources. So you have a big server, and every people that connecting have a share of this server, have a share of co every component, everything is distributed between every users, basically. What we did is something totally different. We are building on demand a computer every, one, every time that someone is connecting. So we have a virtual machine that will connect to directly to component, and the component will be dedicated. I mean, you will have, a, when you're using it, you will have a, GTA, a GPU, you will have a CPU, you will have some memory, you will have uh, your hard drive, of course, everything will be dedicated for you and not shared with someone else. What we do is calling temporal sharing, basically. And I also wanted to ask about how you plan on making that price model affordable, because someone subscribing to a 800, 1,000 euro gaming computer for 30 euros doesn't exactly sound like a very cost-efficient uh, business model. No, because it's not cost-efficient if you're doing that for one people. Luckily, it's cost-efficient, and that's the reason why uh, shareholders invest 60 million more in our company, uh, thanks to uh, the fact that it's actually a working business model. The fact is that, we again, we are using temporal, temporal mutualization. So when you're using the computer, your 1,500 computer is just for you. But actually, when you're not using it, the component can be used by someone else. Okay. But no matter how well the company can cut costs on their end, they still have to make the user experience appealing on our end. And this is kind of where OnLive lost me when I first tried it in 2011. Having the option to play the same games, but with worse graphics, laggier controls, and through an unreliable video connection was a hard sell. The one chip in OnLive's favor was in saving customers a lot of money. First by cutting off pricey system requirements, and second by offering game deals so cheap they were almost close to free but you uh, kind of got what you paid for. It didn't catch on. Since OnLive closed in 2015, Sony gobbled up a lot of their patents and their biggest competitor, a company called Gaikai, whose free PC browser demos were something I actually remember working quite well. So it makes sense that their new brand, as PlayStation Now, enjoys a sustained but unpopular existence as a cheap rental shop for last-gen backlog buggers. An unexpected dynamic from Sony that actually kind of turned my head on this situation was a PC release of their service. Now, citizens of the world can finally kind of play Red Dead Redemption on a PC. An inferior option than even a crappy port is better than no option at all, I guess. But the unpopularity of streaming games on PC has left actual PC game streaming in much, much worse shape. The unsteady leader of this leaderless world is now a service called Liquid Sky, which, just like Emmanuel's shadow box, streams an entire gaming PC to a little video window inside of what'll most likely be another gaming PC. Though there's support for mobile versions as well. But setting this thing up is a sore reminder of why OnLive failed in the first place. Hardcore PC gamers well off enough to enjoy the most expensive upfront cost in gaming are probably not pinching enough pennies to see the value in any one of Liquid Sky's myriad of pricing plans. You got pay as you go, you got monthly subscriptions, and what the hell are Sky credits? As it turns out, this scheme is a lot like old cell phone plans. 
A more honest name for Sky Credits would be Sky Minutes. They are a converted currency consumed by the minute when using their service on any one of these plans. And after picking a plan of bulk rollover minutes, you then pick how high quality you want those minutes to be. One minute of renting their regular computer costs you one Sky Credit. On a top tier machine that'll burst through any game's ultra settings, that cost is two Sky Credits per minute. Different plans have an assortment of different rules and conditions, and one sharp reminder of how abstracted your whole session is, is the login requirement. The cheaper plans require you to log in at least once every few days, or else your share of their hard drives gets deleted. I went with the $20 a month option, which gives you 80 hours per month of streamed video game, which sounds like a lot until you do some math. That's two and a half hours per day. Anyways, I PayPal'd some fresh new Patreon fun bucks over to test it out, and... Oh. Oh, oh, oh. So it turns out that this hardware acceleration option, enabled by default, creates two entire seconds of lag that render gaming, let alone basic workplace computing, impossible. But just switch that off and response time suddenly got much more reasonable for me, clocking in at about... Four. ...frames of this 30 FPS camera footage. That's just 30, so double that to 60, and I'm guessing that you're likely to see about eight frames of video idle by before your inputs get displayed on screen. At 60 FPS, that's one eighth of a second. And for slower paced stealth games and point and click strategy games, that actually isn't likely to cause a horrifically inferior experience, but it's obviously not great for faster genres. FPS camera movement with the mouse feels like it's stuck in a sticky, delicious syrup, which is probably why all the Liquid Sky introductory videos recommend you use a controller instead. Either way, your window into their gaming PC is still gonna get fogged up with compression artifacts. Since this is an entire gaming PC you're streaming, and not just a selection of partnered games, you still have to buy your own games through your own library at their regular market value. Liquid Sky's official support for Steam Blizzard and Origin games does miss at least one popular PC multiplayer choice. Rainbow Six Siege on the universally louved Ubisoft Uplay Fun client, for some reason, wouldn't connect me to matches at all and would cause frequent hard crashes and freezes. So what has a lifetime of PC gaming taught me to do in that situation? Reflex had me alt-tabbing, alt-f4ing, and control alt deleting which would just end up closing me out of the streaming app on my computer instead of closing the game app on their computer. Which led to this hilarious wrestling match between the two PCs where I'd have to very carefully mash or hold down those alt-f4s because even they were inputs being lagged. In other words, if you alt-tab in the game, you alt-tab in real life. But to be fair, on a hardwired cable connection to my desktop gaming PC while using the most popular of the officially supported games, the service does seem to work as intended. And even though you're still paying by the minute when re-downloading your own games onto their machines, the downloads do happen as fast as advertised. Which is way faster than I've ever seen in my entire life, it's unreal. 30 gigs of Siege downloaded in like 6 minutes. But what about experiencing PC gaming on the go, on their Android app like they also advertise? I set up Civ 6 to try out a slow-paced, point-and-click, turn-based, mouse-only scheme that seems like it would make sense on this platform. But 10 seconds into the intro cutscene and I notice that Sean Bean and his strange alien daughter both start to sound a little off. Yeah, unfortunately there was no easy option to check that fixes this mess. And even when the game's finally up and running, here's another problem. How, uh, how do I right click? Turns out the official method is a double tap, but with input lag being as inconsistent as it is, the timing window to register a successful double tap is as inconsistent as it is. And don't get me started on getting it started on coffee shop Wi-Fi because I couldn't get it started. But on top of the familiar reliability and latency issues, which don't seem to have improved since OnLive in 2011, these services almost seem like they're getting more expensive than OnLive was in 2011. At $20 a month, a year of Liquid Sky costs $240 which is around the ballpark of how much I spent on my last PC upgrade two years ago, while also being enough of a loser to play way more than 80 hours of games per month. So I actually doubt that anyone who wholesale replaces their gaming PC with this system is going to be saving themselves money. 
Regardless, I can think of occasional specific situations where this service would be useful, such as while traveling with an underpowered laptop. But that's still assuming that the hotel or hotspot Wi-Fi can come anywhere close to the stability of an Ethernet cable. And even when trying to stream through my own WLAN to the Steam link, this has just never, ever worked out for me. PS Now games tend to play okay and seem to feel like the gold standard right now of network latency for this sort of thing, but once I switch them over to Wi-Fi, this inevitably happens after less than 10 minutes. And that's not just me. Even the CEOs of this business have the same problem. Remember the Shadowbox demo playing on the cell phone and the MacBook? Emmanuel Freund was eager to show this stuff off on a big living room TV too, up until Gamescom's spotty Wi-Fi broke the presentation right there in their own booth. You got issues of reliability, issues of pricing, issues of quality, and last but not least, issues of infrastructure. The next biggest thing killing game streaming is, without even exaggerating, the American Internet. Where so much of the entire country's online infrastructure is controlled by just two companies who really have the final word over whether or not these small businesses that have nothing to do with them succeed or fail. In 2014, I made a video about how game streaming services were scaring the bejesus out of me. When looking back, that seems a little alarmist? Probably because my pessimistic predictions didn't end up happening, thank god, but I don't doubt that it was also informed by my environment at the time. Because that was also around the time when Comcast rolled out a 300 gigabyte data cap that was just straight up unreasonable. One download of Grand Theft Auto is a fifth of that. And for connections shared between roommates or families, 300 gigabytes would easily be passed with average use precisely because of the popularity of streaming. So how generous of Comcast then to raise that cap, which used to not exist at all even before they hiked my costs, to one terabyte in 2016. Coincidentally, around the same time Google Fiber opened up in Atlanta. That data cap is really the hard limit of how many American customers can even use these services. That cap is the most relevant number. I tinkered with streaming Pyre through another cloud computing service called Paperspace, which performed and looked and was priced about on par with Liquid Sky, but I was measuring my usage as I went along. One hour of game streaming is about two and a half gigabytes, giving me a hard cap from the ISP of just under 410 hours of game streaming per month which will be subtracted by literally everything else I do on the internet. To be fair, that does seem reasonable for one guy, and I haven't come close to hitting that yet, but, but what about normal people who share their internet connections with their families or a flat full of roommates? One family member deciding to download Grand Theft Auto could easily ruin it for everyone else. Bringing us back to the family arguments of the 56k days where everyone had to stay off the phone for one person to use the internet. Meanwhile, you're juggling that hard cap of internet usage against a soft cap of your Liquid Sky credits remaining to access an online library of digital games, all of which are either licenses you're using or services you're renting, rather than products you're owning. Every layer of this arrangement is prone to the kind of outages, hacking, and corporate abuse that hardcore gamers never fail to make a scandal out of. But, in terms of my own opinion, I have changed my mind about streaming slightly, and slowly, but I still think the technology isn't quite there yet. America's internet infrastructure is definitely not there yet, and the business strategies that so many of these companies are aiming for are aiming at the wrong targets. I would like to have these kinds of services as a temporary option for keeping my PC games going while traveling, but they've got to work better over Wi-Fi for that to be convenient enough to catch on in a big way. But... If the day ever comes that a game publisher lies about an offline single-player game requiring it to be streamed through the cloud for some bullshit reason, I'm out! I'm done! Mind changed! Back to where it was before! Back to, back to pessimism! Until then, attempts to replace household gaming PCs with streamed remote gaming PCs just seem like attempts to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Biennial hardware upgrades combined with dirt cheap Steam cells is still a cheaper long term budget plan than paying $20 or $30 a month to game. Which means that the current trend of streaming over an entire computer is actually more expensive than the older trend of streaming selected games from partnered publishers for dirt cheap. Ideally, I think the best idea to ever come out of game streaming were concepts of replacing free game demos with them which Gaikai actually partnered with EA to make happen for a short while during 2011. I've also talked to fans of mine who used to use OnLive's free trials for that same purpose, for trying out a game on a stream before buying the real thing on their own hardware. Also, this never did happen, but imagine how neat it'd be for the skippable ads before a YouTube video to be a little 5 minute demo of a AAA game before you watch a review of the same AAA game. 
But free game demos are honest and transparent enough to actually hurt game sales more than they help, so don't be surprised if that never happens again. Until then, I think we're a long, long way off from this technology really catching on.